So what we've got is a single value of our richness of our well-known taxa, taxon, that corresponds to wildly different overall richnesses of all of the set of taxa. Let me show you the same thing another way. Here's a point that falls far to the right of this general linear relationship. That is a place that is particularly rich in butterflies, but particularly poor or relatively poor for the rest of the taxa. So here's another way of looking at this. Here are richness patterns for butterflies. And you can see for butterflies and birds, the pattern is pretty much the same. It's the eastern US. It's the eastern deciduous forests. I grew up right about there, so that's kind of home for me. But look at trees and amphibians. Just watch where the black areas fall. Here's birds and butterflies, and here's trees and amphibians. Uh-oh, completely different patterns. And here's vascular plants, yet a different pattern. So that first complication is simply that different taxa show different patterns. So I couldn't use just birds, because remember, birds were in the southeast and trees were in the southwest. Why can't I get you guys to clap like that? <laughs> and of course, now the door is open again. Thank you, Bilal. OK, second complication is simply one of resolution. So don't really need to pay so much attention to this paper, but pay attention to um, these three hypothetical sites, OK? Or sets of three hypothetical sites. Look at site A1. It's got 12 species. Site A2 has four of those, and site A3 has two of those, OK? But in this example, we have quite a bit of spatial turnover, OK? Which is to say, from one place to the next, we get different sets of species. In site three, we have some turnover different sets of species between sites, but also nestedness, where everything at site, sorry, at site C3 is in site one. And then here in, in example D, we just have turnover. Okay, this is gonna cause us some trouble very quickly. Okay, We've, we talked about this yesterday with Mona, with, you know, with examples A and C, all you do is pick site C1 or A1 and you're done. But with sites B and D, you have more trouble. So let's, let's look at whether we're getting enough resolution in one taxon necessarily to pick up stuff like this where we have endemic species. So let's take Australia. You remember Australia was a very well represented uh, continent in the uh, in the bird data set. So in Australia, we have very good, very dense data for birds. So let's use those data. Let's pick out some patterns. I just went down the list of the really rare and endangered birds of Australia. Here's one, Australian painted snipe. It's a little shorebird. And what you can see is that it has populations all down the east coast and then here on the northwest coast and here on the southwest coast. Okay? That's not going to pick out micro <coughs> patterns of microendemism. Let's take another one. This is a really cool bird, by the way. No confirmed records since 1990, despite several dedicated searches and publicity campaigns. Finally, the species was rediscovered in 2005 in Western Australia and a dead juvenile was found in Queensland in 2006. So look at 
its range. It's known from two little splotches, but notice they're half a continent apart, which is to say bird endemism in Australia is pretty coarse spatially. Okay? Now let's look at just one other Australian taxon that maybe we would want to include in our conservation thinking. The title of the paper is Extraordinary Microendemism in Australian Desert Spring Amphipods. So here's all of Australia, right? And then within this box, we see this area. And then within this box, so this is a tiny little area right about there, within this box, we see this. These guys go in and do a bunch of molecular phylogenetic analyses, and they find all of, each one of these different colors is something that might be termed a different species. So let's put that on the map, and it looks like that. But remember, that was nestled within a tiny part of a tiny part of Australia. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, something, ten species in a tiny little part of central southern Australia. So what's worse still is our resolution is also different in the digital accessible knowledge. Here's 32.6 million bird records across Australia. And for those amphipods, we have 423. And almost all of them look like they're down in Tasmania. Are we gonna build a conservation prioritization or those strategies that, that Lee was exploring with you for these amphipods? No? Okay. So where are we? We're kind of in a bind. Indicator species. It's a good idea. Ideally, we would build really com uh, complete, well-curated data sets and information resources for our few indicator taxa and use those to guide conservation for all of biodiversity. It's definitely the case that different taxa are known better or worse than one another. Sometimes our, our indicator will really work well. And sometimes they won't be at all representative. So I outlined a couple of pro sets of problems for you, different patterns, different resolutions. Um, if you use the, an indicator that's not a good indicator, then you may get to the wrong answer for a non-indicator taxon. And if you use the wrong resolution, if you use a very generic indicator like birds, then you may completely miss areas of endemism, crucial conservation areas for those other taxa. So what do we do? Anybody want to give me some answers before I throw some at you? What's the solution? Nobody wants to take a shot at it? I'll throw one out. Certainly we need more data, right? Certainly emphasizing broad availability of detailed primary research grade data across many taxa is crucial to this. I see a question from Bilal. So this is hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. So this is super interesting for somebody that doesn't study birds. Um, Thank you. And it's, and it's uh, you know, it, it raises a number of questions, which is, um, beyond the sort of broad scale availability, that means that we have to be doing something at the grassroots level to encourage more people to 
see, understand, and document birds as being important indicators for biodiversity and of biodiversity itself. Uh, how do we do that on the African continent? Okay, so the point of this is that we not need not just birds, but yeah. so I would say that it's, it's got to be multi-pronged, which is to say it's got to unite both the power of numbers in citizen scientists with the power of information in detailed scientific collections. And yes, that goes for birds, it goes for primates. Things need to be collected and preserved to provide fullest documentation of biodiversity. Um, but I think also, and this was kind of the, the purpose of that, that global mapping that I showed at the beginning, what we're planning to do is to put out maps of gaps into the, I mean, the birding community is incredibly sophisticated. Um, and we're planning to essentially provide maps at country and regional scales and challenge people to fill in those gaps. Because a lot of birders, myself included, have species lists from places. And mine are sitting in old notebooks up in my office. And, you know, if I knew that one of those sites was a big gap that I could fill. Forward it on. Exactly. Not forward it on, type it in. Uh, and so, so certainly one part of the puzzle is, is this kind of marshalling information. There's a whole, whole different talk that we could have about how do you maximize the flow of information. And essentially what you want to do is, is take the information that's closest to being digital accessible knowledge and maybe it's just missing one little detail, right? So maybe it's digital, maybe it's accessible, but it's not integrated into the global storehouse of information. All you have to do, yeah. Or maybe it's digital, but it's not accessible. So you only have two steps to go. And of course, at the very end point, you can also go back out into the field, which I love doing, but you should go back out into the field in places that represent the biggest gaps. So you want to go to the field educated by what you already know. So, and there's also, so, you know, to bring this back to the GIS, GPS stuff, uh, I'm sure you know about this also, and perhaps could speak more about it, but there are so many apps nowadays that are easily accessible on your phone that, you know, will allow you to do uh, stuff including household surveys. But uh, there's one app uh, which is an open source one called Memento on Android, which allows you to put a GPS timestamp, a date time stamp, and a possible photo on it. Mm -hmm. And you can prepare the lists from beforehand and select which ones you're seeing. So, uh, and you know, that would be a great way to get even, you know, school groups out to try sure. and mess with sure. technology, but also learn about birds. Yeah. Well, learn with birds, learn about birds, but also yeah. mess with technology. eBird, iNaturalist, there's a bunch of platforms. Um, one of my recent PhD graduates, Vijay Barve, actually did a, uh, a pretty amazing bit of work where he, he probed into Flickr just a photo server where there are billions of photos that people have uploaded. And he searched all of Flickr for photographs that had bird names. And he searched across all bird names, all common names and all scientific names. And he assembled more than six million usable records of biodiversity. And he's shown that the error rates in these completely uncurated Flickr records are actually comparable to the error rates in, in things that you would think are more, are more reliable. So there's a, a lot of room for creativity. Let's keep going down this, this final slide. Um, a second element beyond just broad availability of information obviously has to be developing multiple analyses. 